When we went over the doctrine of God, which was, uh, we started that series quite some time ago, I had a little introductory um, um, statement about the principles that we want to apply in order to interpret the scripture properly and to understand the Bible the way it ought to be understood. And I want to go over those principles again because they need to be fresh in our mind. We're going to be starting a new uh, module, if you want to call it, on the doctrine of man. I mean, in my opinion, the doctrine of God and the doctrine of man are the two most important foundational things that we need to understand in order to understand the whole Bible. All right. If we get those wrong, then we're going to we're going to have a lot of problems. It affects pretty much every other area of theology in the entire Bible. So what I want to do is I want to deal again with these principles. And I have seven principles for interpreting the Bible. And I'd like for you to write these down if you have a pen. Um, if you don't, um, we can get them later, I guess. But let's, uh, and I want to discuss them with you. There's some paper in the back uh, there if somebody needs some um, in that little holder. <clears throat> All right. Let's look at these interpretive principles. Now, I think you guys would agree with me that if we are going to understand the Bible, we have to have a set of rules that we apply when we understand the Bible. You can't just you can't just treat the Bible any way you want. And unfortunately, a lot of people do, right? They take verses out of context. They string together a verse here and a verse here and a verse over there, and they construct them together and make a doctrine out of it. Well, that's not the way to understand the Bible. And we're going to talk about why. These, all of these rules are really simple common sense. But the very first one that we're going to have is the fact that the original scriptures are infallible. That's our number one rule. Now, what does that mean? It means that the Bible is never wrong. That's what it means. All right? If we can't make sense out of the Bible, the problem is with us, not the Bible. The Bible is always right. Now, you can say, well, why, why are we assuming that that's true? Well, if you're saying that, you haven't come to the previous classes, have you? Because we spent quite a bit of time at the very beginning talking about why there is a God from a philosophical point of view, why the scriptures are true. We went through all that stuff at the, um, in the opening um, module. So we're going to assume that that's the case now, that since we've proven it. If you don't, if you don't um, understand that, then I would encourage you to go back and watch the videos at the very beginning of the series that talk about the um, reasons to believe, which was the first module that we went over a few months ago. All right, so the scriptures are infallible. We, we're not going to transgress that rule. Number two, the grammar is very important. And it's, it's um, when you look at the way people handle the scriptures, even pastors, the way that they handle the scriptures, very often they violate the grammar of the scriptures. And there is going to be times in this class when I will, t I will go back to the Greek, and unfortunately, you know, I know you guys don't know Greek, but I'm going to have to explain certain principles of grammar that we're going to have to go over because they affect the outcome of a particular passage of Scripture. I'll give you one example of that, just very briefly. Um, in 1 Peter 3, 19, you don't need to turn there, but there is a passage there that many people claim teaches that Jesus, when he died, that while his body was in the tomb, that his ghost traveled somewhere and preached a message to other ghosts. It talks about uh, him going and preaching to the spirits that were in prison. Now, this is a passage where the grammar makes all the difference in the world. Because if you study the, gram the Greek grammar, it's very clear that he did that after his resurrection and not before his resurrection. All right? So he didn't do it as a disembodied spirit or ghost. He did it after he was resurrected. He did it in the flesh. And that makes all the difference in the world with regard to uh, one particular doctrine. All right? So we are going to, when we come across passages like that, we are going to talk a little bit about grammar. And I hope you guys don't mind that. But I think you'll learn a lot about grammar if you, you know, stay with me. All right, the next, the next principle that's very important is that we have to interpret the scripture within its historical setting. 
you know, there are a lot of people that their approach to the Bible is, they'll look at a particular passage and their approach is, well, what does this verse mean to me? Have you ever been in, in Sunday school classes where they'll read a passage of scripture and they'll say, you know, people go around the room, well, what does this verse mean to you, sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so? And they'll, you know, give their, kind of how they would understand it. But their understanding of it, very often, if, you're, if that's the question, their understanding of it is going to be based on their worldview, their situation, their historical setting, you know, their, what's going on in their life. But see, the Bible isn't written that way. The Bible is not a bunch of disconnected verses that you can just grab and apply it to your life. In order for you to understand the Bible properly, you have to understand who said it, to whom was it said, and what was the circumstance in which it was said. Because there are no verses in the Bible that were written directly to you. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. But there are no scriptures that were written directly to you. Not one. Every scripture in the Bible was written to a particular audience in history. And if you don't understand who it was written to and what their situation was and what the person who was writing or speaking was trying to address in that particular situation, and you just say, well, what does this mean to me? You're going to get it wrong most of the time. All right? The truths of the Bible have a very narrow and specific meaning for a very narrow and specific situation. Now, once we understand what the situation was, and we understand it historically, we, understand, we don't ask the question, what does this mean to me? Instead, we ask the question, what did this mean to the people to whom it was written? That's the right question to ask. Okay, And when we understand that, then we can learn we can learn how certain truths are applied to a very particular historical situation. And when we do that, when we understand that, then we can draw principles from that and make proper application to ourselves. Right? We have to do that. Otherwise, we're going to misapply the scriptures consistently. So, uh, in, interpreting in, within the historical setting is a very, very critical Thing. And we're going to, as we go through different passages of scripture, we're going to talk about historical settings. You guys probably know that when I preach through various books of the Bible, like we've been, we had been going through Philippians, which we're going to pick up again um, later in the second service. But whenever I start a series on a particular book of the Bible, what's the very first thing I do? My, my entire first lesson is on what? You guys have been coming here long enough to know. The history of that particular group of people. Like Philippians, when we talked about Philippians, what did I do? My very first sermon on Philippians was not in Philippians. We went to the book of Acts, and we looked at the history of how that church was started, right, by the Apostle Paul. We looked at its geographical area, and what the book of Acts says about the demographic makeup of that church, the situation that, uh, that uh, it was started in as, you know, um, um, Anyway, you guys get the idea, right? So that's, that's uh, very important to the way I teach, and it's going to be very important to this class. All right, the next, the next principle that's critical is that we interpret the Scripture in the right order. And I have the word progressively there for a reason. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you take a verse, let's say you grab a verse out of Revelation. If you don't understand that the book of Revelation, not only was it not written to you, it's for our benefit, yes, it's been preserved for our benefit, but it wasn't written to us. If, we, if you do not understand that the book of Revelation is simply sort of the final climax of a long series of, hey Jeff, good to see you, of a long series of prophecies, and that Revelation throughout the entire book keeps quoting from the Old Testament and keeps referencing specific Old Testament passages and concepts, if you don't interpret Revelation based on what came before it and all this foundational prophecy that came first, and you try to interpret it in a vacuum, you're going to, have the wrong, you're going to come up with the wrong conclusion time and time and time and time again. All right? 
everything that God has revealed, he has done so over a period of many, many years. Isn't that right? I mean, the Bible starts with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the books of Moses. Well, that's the story. It was written by Moses. It's a story of creation all the way up until uh, the children of Israel were to go into the promised land. Right? It gives a history. It's history. Well, as the prophets come along later, and they are prophesying to the nation of Israel, it's based on the law of Moses and all that has been written before it, right? And then we get to the time of Christ, when Jesus is talking to his disciples or he's speaking to the crowds of people. These are Jews, and these Jews have, as their history, all the Old Testament. And all the prophets, they have all of that, right? So when Jesus is talking to them and he says something to them, it's, it's with the knowledge, Jesus has the knowledge of what they know based on what God has revealed up to that point. So what he says to them was meant to be understood with that historical background that they had. And if you try to understand it without that historical background, or if you try to understand it with some background that is totally different then that historical mindset that the Jews had at that time, you're going to miss the point. All right, does that make sense to you guys? You get that, right? All right, so progressive revelation and progressive interpretation is a really a fundamental rule that uh, should, be, um, should be stuck with. So when we, we take the doctrine of man, we want to understand things in this order, in the order that God has revealed it. Everything that God reveals in addition to what he revealed in the past is going to complement what came before it. Now, is later revelation going to contradict earlier revelation? No, of course not. I mean, if one God gave us the entire Bible, if one God, if all these truths come from God, and if God is the, is the one, is, is it going to conflict with itself? Are we going to have the Old Testament conflicting with the New Testament? See, if our understanding of these things causes conflict, there's something wrong with our interpretation. All right? Because harmony is the key to having the truth. When you can find harmony in the scriptures, and not only do the scriptures agree, but the scriptures are, are uh, consistent with themselves and with God's nature. If, you, if your interpretation of a particular doctrine has that kind of harmony, and there's not... You're not just grabbing some verses and saying, well, my, my doctrine agrees with these verses, but then there's these other verses over here that conflict with your doctrine. There's something wrong with your understanding of the scriptures because there is no conflict in what God has revealed. All right? And if there is conflict, the conflict is in your mind because you are assuming things that are not true. All right? So that harmony is very, very critical. All right, now... Let's look at another point that's very important, and that is that any doctrine that we come up with from the Bible cannot defy simple logic. That is, the Bible does not ask us to accept ideas that are illogical, that are irrational. Now, there are a lot of churches that teach doctrines that are irrational, that, that defy logic. They should not be accepted. Now, why do I say that? You, you know, some people would say, well, um, you know, God is greater than we are. His reasoning is so much higher than ours. In fact, the Bible says that, that my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways, right? As the heaven is higher than the earth, so, you know, so God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. But does that mean that God uses a different kind of reasoning than we do that to us is illogical and irrational? No, we might not be able to fully understand it, but it shouldn't be self-contradictory. All right, now, why do I say that? Um, let's, can anybody think, let me, let, me, let me ask you this. Can anybody think of an example of a teaching or a doctrine that is that requires us to defy logic. We talked about one not that long ago. It had to do with the person of Christ. Did your hand go up? I would also go say predestination. Okay, that's another one. And actually, I want to use that example for, for, for my next point. 
Well, yeah, for my, I'm going to use that example for my next point. All right, well, let's, just, let's move on to my next point then. Agreement with God's nature is essential for every doctrine that we accept. Now, this is the one where I think Calvinism is an excellent example where there is not agreement with God's nature. See, the Bible tells us some very specific things about God and about who he is and what his nature and his character is like. Right? Tell me some things about God's nature and his character. Long-suffering. All right. He's very long-suffering or patient. Carl? All right. He's gracious and forgiving and merciful. What's that? Okay. Meek. Gentle. What else? Holy. Holy, which means what? Utterly righteous, he cannot sin, right? God cannot sin. Well, what does Calvinism teach? It teaches that God is sovereign over everything that happens. That is, God is the ultimate cause of absolutely everything. That when you put your, if you put your shoes on the wrong feet this morning when you got dressed, God actually caused that to happen. Right. Now, ultimately, Calvinism teaches that God is sovereign in every little thing that happens. Every bug that hits your windshield, God is in control of. Now, if that's true, we have a paradox. What is a paradox? A lot of bad stuff happens. A lot of wicked stuff happens. A lot of people do a lot of wicked things. Now, is God ultimately the one who is causing those things to occur. Well, if he is, then he's wicked. But the Bible says he's not. The Bible says he's righteous, and he's holy, and, he, and there's no darkness in him at all. So there is a tension that builds up between the idea that God is in control of absolutely everything that happens and this idea that the Bible tells us that God is righteous and he, there's nothing evil in him at all. So there's a problem there. All right. The, my point is, when we see these kinds of conflicts arising in the things that we are, you know, what we think we're seeing in Scripture, if we start seeing these kinds of conflicts with the character and the nature of God, then there's something wrong with our understanding of that doctrine. What I'm saying to you is that agreement with God's nature is probably the primary test of any doctrine as to whether it's true or not. The Bible's very plain as to what God's nature is. All right? It's very plain. So if we see, if we see a doctrine that, um, that is contrary to, the, to that, uh, then we should, we should at least, at, at the very least, you should put a big giant question mark on that conclusion and say, we need to take another look at this. All right? There's something wrong here. We're, we're, miss, we're missing something. All right, and then finally, uh, number seven is it's really a very good idea to try to trace the history of the development of the various doctrines and points of view. This, is, this can be very, very revealing regarding uh, whether a doctrine is true or not, particularly when we talk about the circumstances under which a particular doctrine has come about and has entered into Christianity and has developed within Christianity. All right, um, we'll we'll see this uh, as we um, move on. We'll see examples of that. But understanding how the doctrines develop, you know, there was a saying that any new doctrine is false, right, or something like that. I forget the exact saying. Anything new? No, never mind. I messed that up. <laughs> yeah, there's a little rhyme thing. Anyway, but basically what it says is if it's, if it's a new doctrine, if it's something that cannot be found very early on, right, right back to the time of the apostles, then you ought, to, you ought to question it. All right, if it's something that came about in the 1800s and there's no record of it prior to that or the... 1600s or the 1500s, and there's no record of it prior to that, then we probably ought to question it. All right? And why is that? Because 
Yeah, because it, it didn't come from the apostles. It didn't come from Jesus and the apostles. And, the, and the, that's our authority, is it not? I mean, they're the ones who wrote the New Testament, the prophets and the apostles. And, of course, Jesus' words are recorded by the apostles for us. And the New Testament, that's our authority. And if it's something that has been come up with after, long after um, they were here, then and, and we can see that historically. Now, keep in mind, though, when we're doing that, we, we will do it from time to time. Keep in mind that we don't have a whole lot of data to work with. All right, the evidence that we have from history is fragmentary. So just because we don't find something explicitly stated doesn't always necessarily mean it didn't exist, but we should have some evidence of it. Um, you know, at least something, some crumbs or something, um, some kind of evidence. All right, let's move on to um, our first. Um, let me get a page down here. What I want to do is, as we, we're going to talk about the doctrine of man, and it's, it's going to consist of what is a man and what is man's destiny. And I want to approach it from a little different way. Now, you may remember that we had a series of classes a while back on the destiny of the wicked, and we approached this by starting in Genesis and kind of working our way through to try to find out what is a man. What I want to do here is I want to approach it from a little different angle. This, um, the angle I want to approach it from now is to kind of give you the broad spectrum of what the various beliefs are out there. And then as we go through the scriptures, we're going to try to test these various views and see which one seems to conform to the scriptures more and which ones seem to have a lot more problems in the scriptures. All right, so... What we want to do is talk about three views with regard to man that are out there. Number one is the idea of I mean, what I'm calling, and, and is normally called, the immortality of the soul. Now, what does this view mean? Well, essentially, it means that you are a, a being that consists of two very different parts, that you have a body and that inside of your body is what I'm going to call a ghost. Some people call it a spirit, some people call it a soul, but they're very inconsistent in how they use the terminology. And uh, so because of that inconsistency, I'm going to use the term ghost because I think that is a term that everybody understands what we're talking about, right? When you, when you talk about a ghost, you have the idea that, you know, a person dies and there's this invisible, immaterial essence that comes out of them that is still that person that is still conscious, that can still think and feel and move even without a body and you know, without a brain. All right. Um, now, this idea of the immortality of the soul essentially says that a man is a ghost living in a flesh suit or a flesh body, which implies that your body is not an absolutely necessary part of who you are. That is, it might be important, but it's not absolutely necessary to your personhood. That is, your body, if your body is disposed of, you still can go on living as a conscious entity. All right? Um, now, the thing about this point of view is that the, the, those who have held it in the past, and when I say those who have held it, I'm talking about not just Christians. I'm talking about pagans, Jews, whoever have held it. They have a certain view of the afterlife. And their view of the afterlife is that after your soul or ghost leaves your body, then there's some sort of judgment to be had, right? Because if there is no judgment then, and there's no reward or punishment, then what? Then there's no responsibility in life, and life is totally meaningless, isn't that right? Unless there's some kind of judgment and some kind of justice at the end of life, then there's no point in doing what is good and what is right. And there's no penalty for doing what is evil and what is wrong. So mankind has known since the dawn of time that, that there must be a God and that there must be justice in the end and that there must be reward or punishment. 
all right? Pretty much everybody has believed that until you come to more modern times where you have atheists. All right, but prior to that, pretty much everybody has believed that there is some kind of retribution or reward to be had after death. Well, the idea of the immortality of the soul solves that problem. It solves it by saying when, you're, when your body dies, your immaterial ghost, which is immortal and indestructible, by the way, which means it will never die, it will live forever, your immortal soul then has to face some sort of justice without the body. So there's some kind of judgment, there's some kind of reward, or there's some kind of punishment for the soul without the body. Okay? You guys get that concept? All right. Now, who has, who has held to this point of view? You see I have on the screen, and, and when, I, when I have these um, uh, lists of those who have held, it's not an exhaustive list, but these, generally speaking, um, pagans almost always hold this view. Okay, the various pagan uh, groups. Um, some Jews have held this view. In the time of Christ, there was a group of Jews called the Essenes. And they held this view. Um, modern or fairly modern Jews or Jews down since the time of Christ. Uh, you probably have heard of Kabbalists, which are sort of mystical Jews and they follow very mystical. It's kind of new agey, Eastern mystical kind of uh, adaption of Judaism. Um, they hold this point of view. Most Christians also hold this view. That is that when a person dies, there is an immaterial ghost that leaves his body, that remains conscious, that cannot be destroyed, that cannot die, and that um, there will be some kind of reward or punishment um, for that um, in, in that state. Whether it's their ghost immediately goes to heaven in the presence of God, or their ghost immediately goes into hell where it's tormented in, without a body, somehow tormented in flames without a body. I don't know how that works, but... Anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's the view. Um, Catholics are very much, in fact, their entire system depends on this. Isn't that right? Prayer to the saints. What does that imply? That the ghost of the saints is in heaven listening to their prayers. Right? Purgatory. What does that imply? that the souls or ghosts of, pe of your relatives who have died are somehow suffering now, uh, somewhere, and all that sort of thing, yes? When they pray for the repose of the soul, that's what they're referring to, people who have died are in purgatory, and they kind of get to heaven. Get, yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Right, so Roman Catholicism will, won't work without this foundation. Isn't that right? I mean, their whole system, they think Mary's floating around somewhere not in her grave, right? Their whole system crumbles and falls apart and all their popes become false prophets if this is wrong. All right, what else? Most non-atheists, even in modern times. You know, if you, go, if you watch TV shows or you go to movies, you'll see this idea that man is, a, is an immaterial ghost living in a body. You'll see it everywhere. You know, I mean, movies about ghosts, movies about the supernatural, all that kind of stuff depends on this kind of reasoning. Isn't that right? Okay. Well, let's look at the next point of view, the second one. Uh, the first one is probably the most common worldwide and has been historically. The second view is less common, but it's still very common. And it's called conditional immortality. Now, what does that mean? Well, it views man as a single entity, not a dual entity, right? Immortality of the soul believes that there's an immortal person that cannot die, that must live forever, that is absolutely indestructible, living inside of a destructible, temporary flesh body, right? Well, conditional immortality doesn't see man as two separate entities kind of fused together, where the one can live without the other, it views man as a single entity that is a living, physical person. That is a physical flesh body that is alive. 
Okay? And that's what a man is. So if you kill the body, the man ceases to exist. All right? Just a dead body is not a man, is it? Not anymore. All right? Okay, what, what about the afterlife? Those who hold the view of conditional immortality, they do believe in an afterlife. Now, most of them do, let's put it that way. They believe in an afterlife. But if man is a single entity that is physical, a living body, if that's what a man is, then what kind of afterlife can there be? There's only one way. Resurrection. Resurrection is the only way you can have an afterlife. Therefore, those who believe in conditional immortality believe that the hope of the righteous is to be resurrected physically and to have a reward physically, that is, they will live forever in the flesh, maybe changed, maybe better, maybe totally healed, maybe perfect, but still a physical person. And those who are evil, that there is retribution for them as well. But again, the only way that retribution can be had, if your view of man is that he is a single entity like this, is also through resurrection. That is, there would have to be a resurrection that results in a um, reward, and there would have to be resurrection in order for the person to be punished. That is, he would have to be in the flesh in order to be punished and to suffer pain and agony or whatever it happens to be. All right, that's conditional immortality. Now, who, who has held this point of view? Most of the Jews. It's the point of view that we're going to see is clearly taught in the Old Testament. Most of Israel down through its history, both in the Old Testament and in the New, and even today, well, I won't say today that they're the majority, but... Um, the common Jews in Jesus' day held this view. The Pharisees, that we, that's talked about all through the Gospels, held this view. Um, there are a lot of others as well. Uh, there have been some, Christian, some Christians early on who held this point of view. If you read uh, Justin's dialogue, there was a man who led Justin to Christ. It's one of the very earliest documents, Christian documents. And he argued contrary to the first view, the immortality of the soul, which was very common then, he argued against that in favor of this conditional immortality. And there are other examples of it in the early church as well. There are some uh, later very well-known Christian theologians who have held this point of view, including Martin Luther. Uh, you all know who that is, right? He's the guy who started the whole Protestant Reformation. Uh, William Tyndale. William Tyndale was another uh, English scho uh, scholar uh, associated with the Reformation. He, he, in fact, he was a martyr. He was killed by the Roman Catholic Church for translating the Bible into English. He was burned at the stake for doing that. In fact, Tyndale's translation is, is one of the... Is, it's not the very first English translation. That was Wycliffe's. But it's the very first English translation from the original languages was William Tyndale's translation of the Bible into English. And um, he, he strongly argued for this point of view of conditional immortality, that there, when a person dies, there is no ghost that flies away. In fact, he, in fact uh, the argument was during the time of the Reformation, Tyndale and Luther and others were arguing against the Catholics who insisted on the immortality of the soul in order to prop up their system of prayer to the saints and purgatory and all that other kind of stuff. And so these reformers, not all the reformers held this view, but some of them did, some of the well-known ones did, they argued that Roman Catholicism was a lot of bunk because it was based on this idea of this immortality of the soul. Um, there are other modern denominations as well. Some of the churches of God hold this point of view. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists hold this point of view. Messianic Jews commonly hold this point of view. And there are even some cults that hold this point of view. There's one, for example, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, there is also one group that actually split off from the group that our church is affiliated with, the Independent Christian Churches and Church of Christ. There was a group that split off from, from, uh, from us um, quite a while ago uh, called the Christadelphians. 
Uh, that's what they named themselves, and they also held this point of view. So it's not it's not uncommon it's not uncommon in Christianity, although it is the minority view in uh, in those who call themselves Christians. All right, let's move on to the last one, <clears throat> and then I got to wrap this up. And that is what we would call mortality. Now everybody believes one of these views, unless they just don't think about it. But I mean, if they have contemplated, they're going to hold to one of these views. And what is mortality? Well, mortality has something in common with conditional immortality, and that is that they would believe that a person is, does not have a separate ghost that can live outside the body. But what they, would, what they would believe is that when you're dead, you're dead, there's no resurrection, and this is the view that's held by atheists. All right? A man is no different than a dog. When he dies, it's all over, he doesn't exist anymore, and that's the end of it. While Conditional immortality would say, no, God is going to resurrect him from the dead to stand before the judgment and to receive his reward. All right? So um, mortality agrees with conditional immortality in what a man is, essentially, but it differs with the idea that there is retribution after, uh, that there is a resurrection, there is retribution. Well, who holds this point of view? Obviously atheists hold that point of view. And the other, there's another uh, fairly large group that existed in Jesus' day that held this view, and that was the Sadducees. In fact, the Bible specifically talks about the Sadducees who deny the resurrection, and they deny angels, demons, and all that stuff. They don't believe in anything that's not physical. All right? And they denied the resurrection. The Sadducees believe that whatever reward you have is in this life, and when you die, it's all over. Pretty much, that's it. All right? Um, Jesus uh, contradicted them and countered them uh, quite a few times in the scriptures. All right. Um, any questions on these views? Yes, Carl. Uh, back to the point of uh, reject all doctrines that defies own logic. One of the things I've always had problems with is you probably covered it in the book is the Bible is in the Old Testament, it seems like the principle of an eye for an eye for a tooth. Yeah. Well, I, this is, Carl, the problem there, in fact, that's a good illustration of the point that I was making, because if we, if we look at those two things, they seem to be contradictory on the surface, right? In one case, he says, you know, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. That's what God said. And then Jesus comes along and says, you heard it was said, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, but I'm telling you, love your enemies and do good to those who, you know, persecute you and all that kind of stuff. Is Jesus contradicted in the Old Testament? If, 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 if you don't understand the historical setting in both of those cases, then it's going to appear to be a contradiction, but it's not a contradiction. And the reason it's not is because the eye for an eye and all that in the law of Moses had to deal with the common law that God gave to, it was a, the civil law that was used to govern the nation of Israel as a nation. It was like, just like the, the civil laws that we have on the books today that say if you go out and kill somebody, this is what the penalty is, right? Well, God provided a civil law to govern a nation that was called by his name where justice would have to be, uh, you know, there has to be justice. If there's not justice, if there's not a penalty with a crime, then what happens to society? What happens to that nation? If there's not a law that says you cannot steal, and if you steal, this is the punishment, what is going to happen to that nation? People are going to steal, <laughs> right? There's no penalty. People are going to come and rob you and take your stuff because they can get away with it. So there has to be laws and there has to be justice in order for there to be a civil society. And so God gave that as part of the law of Moses to govern the nation of Israel as their uh, legal system. The law of Moses was the legal system for the nation of Israel. Then Jesus comes along and he is calling people to voluntarily turn their back on their old life and to be his followers. And he's going to teach them a new way of living that reflects another part of God's nature. Now, the law did reflect God's nature, reflected his justice, because God is just. All right? But when Jesus came along, he wanted his disciples to show to the world, he's 
told him he was sending them out to be lights to the world, right? He wanted them to show God's character in another way, which was what? Grace, mercy, forgiveness, love, all that sort of thing. So when Jesus tells his followers to disregard the law when they are personally injured, that they are to disregard the law that would give them recourse, that law would give them recourse if they pursued that law, He's telling them, he wants them to disregard that law in order to reflect something of God's character, which is love and forgiveness and kindness and all that sort of thing. Does that make sense? Do you guys get that? Yes. Well, I wouldn't say it didn't work like he planned, because he, he foreknew all of that was going to happen. Um, but I think I agree with you. I agree with you in the sense that what we find in the Bible is God taking humanity from, from a, a very corrupt state and progressively br- teaching them and bringing them along until they start to understand some of the more refined things, some of the higher uh, qualities of God's nature. Right? Just like a child, when you're, when you're rearing a child, um, you have to teach them some basic things about right and wrong at the very beginning, right? when they're young, they're immature. You have to slap them on the hand when they do what they're not supposed to do. or you have to, you have, There has to be swift penalties in order to get them to understand the difference between right and wrong. But then as they grow older and they mature, you can start teaching them some more mature things. Right? They learn wisdom and they, and because they have a greater understanding and they develop a nature and a character to do what is right. And they develop the desire to do what is right, hopefully, <laughs> right, over time. And so you can then give them instructions that might be different than what you gave them early on because you're just trying to teach them just the very basics early on. And you teach them a more mature thing. And that's really what we have when you compare what Jesus said about turning the other cheek and you compare it to what the law says. What Jesus said was not intended to be law to govern a nation. All right, What he said in the law of Moses was. But what Jesus said in the New Testament, remember Jesus' followers were to be people that were called out from all the various nations to be a community of people that were to reflect God's true nature and his true character. And so we are being asked voluntarily to follow Jesus' example which was to turn the other cheek. When he was being crucified, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, right? Could Jesus have called for justice while he was being killed and crucified? He could have, because justice would mean all of his accusers would have been wiped out by God. But did he do that? No. Could he have done it? Yes. Did he have a right to do it? Yes. In fact, he said to Peter, put away your sword, right? Don't you know that I can call ask my father and he'd send 10 legions of angels and deliver me from this right but he didn't understand what was going on and what was actually taking place christ had to die he had because of of, uh, you know god's mercy and his love for us christ was a demonstration of that does that make sense carl does that answer your question okay any other uh, questions or comments about what we've talked about yes for the um number number five Mm -hmm. Oh, no, 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 oh, no, oh, no, supernatural, I'm not saying super, no, supernatural is real, it's everywhere in the Bible, all right, no, that's not defying logic, just because we haven't ever seen it happen doesn't mean it can't happen, when I say defy logic, I mean that they, somebody insists that, well, you have to believe this, and you also have to believe this, but yet these two things are mutually exclusive, they can't both be true, all right, from a logical point of view, there's something wrong, with that. That's what I'm saying. No, miracles, I mean, God does stuff all the time that we can't explain. I'm not saying we have to be able to explain it. Um, you know, we're, we're, like, we're like ants walking around down here compared to God, you know, in his wisdom and his knowledge. So we, we can never understand all that God is doing. But what I, let, me, um, let, me, let me put it this way. Yes, God's wisdom and knowledge is far beyond ours. Okay? We accept that. 
We're very finite. He's infinite. But what we read in his word is what he has revealed to us. It's what he has told mankind. Now, we can accept the fact that God knows so many things that we couldn't possibly even understand, even if he tried to communicate them to us. We couldn't possibly understand them, right? But if God gave us his word and he revealed certain things to mankind down through history, God is the one who revealed it, and he's also the one who made our brains. Isn't that right? So, is God going to reveal things to us that conflicts with the hardware wiring that he's g given us in our minds to be able to understand. What's the point of revealing it to us if not to understand? Right? So what I'm saying is what God has given us in the, in the word is only a very small amount of his knowledge. But it's given to us on a level that we should be able to receive and accept. And he's the one who made our brains to work the way it does. Logic is not just some rules that somebody made up. Logic is the way we think. It's human reasoning. And God is the one who designed that and devised it. So his revelation to man was intended to be understood by man. Therefore, if we say, well, what God has revealed to us makes no sense, but we have to accept it anyway, there's something wrong with that. That's all. That's what I'm saying. All right, is that, you guys get that? All right. So, yes, God can do things that we can't possibly understand, and we just accept it and we take it on faith. But we're, we should not take things that are self-contradictory on faith. All right? Because that's a sign that there's something wrong with what we're being taught. And we should, uh, we should question it when that happens. All right, any other questions? Good to go? All right.